Supreme Court is hearing the uh, Pristone case today. There are really two questions, and, and I think we're going to be talking to somebody tomorrow that we will touch on this, but I just want to um, uh, loop you in. There's really two questions. One is, has this been proven, this drug, which is responsible for now 50% of abortions in this country, are medically, indu uh, or, excuse me, um, medically induced, I guess you would yeah. call that. Um, and the question is whether uh, it's safe. And this is um, an absurd question, or I should say an easy one to answer, because this has been in use for years. Um, and you had, uh, what was the number? Something like 6 million uh uh, birthing people took this uh, uh, medication last year. I think there were um, 32 deaths out of the 6 million, some of whom who had other issues as well uh, that are even like not necessarily caused by these. Yeah, this is a legal brief, brief from the FDA. As of December 22, uh, 2022, 32 deaths had been reported among nearly 6 women, 6 million women, uh, and birthing uh, folks who have taken mifepristone, and some of those had obvious alternative causes, such as drug overdose. Um, there is exhaustive scientific record supporting loosening the pill's restrictions, including from the COVID-19 pandemic when the in-person requirement was ter uh, temporarily suspended. Um, there are serious side effects occurring in less than 1% of the patients. Um, so there, safety's not an issue. And then the, the second thing that is being brought up, and I'm unclear, like, you know, if this is the, uh, this was certainly, you know, uh, part of what brought the case in front of the Supreme Court, something called the Comstock Act. And what is the Comstock Act? It is a law named after the attorney, uh, the postmaster general, was it, from 1873? It uh, was written in 1873. They, um, written by people who uh, apparently uh, yeah, postal had, not, inspector, uh, had not heard of the Constitution. Uh, but it basically said you cannot send lewd or lavicious, uh, lascivious, not lascivious, uh, lascivious stuff. Here it is. Lewd, lascivious, indecent, filthy, or vile articles in the mail. It prohibits mailing anything for, quote, any indecent or immoral purpose. Uh, you get to choose, you know, what, what constitutes that, I guess. Right. Like all federal laws. Um and it purports to make a crime to mail any drug that is advertised or described in a manner calculated to lead another to use or apply it for producing an abortion. And um, which is also sort of like a strange thing because, of course, they didn't have drugs that were manufactured specifically to uh, induce abortion at that time, um, per se. Now, of course, like, if they find that you cannot mail these, the drug manufacturers presumably will find a new network in which to get this to people, but it is... But they're part of arguing it in front of the Supreme Court today, some of the manufacturers, along with the FDA. And so uh, we'll get more on this, but, um, you know, you can imagine that if it's a law written in 1873, well, then, of course, uh, Clarence Thomas is like, yes, well, that must be the law of the land, because that's what our founding fathers wanted. Right. Yeah. I mean, the Comstock acts, the people who played Bioshock Infinite, their main villain's name is Comstock. It's sort of set in sort of a late Victorian setting. It, it's a pretty dark Victorian style, like history where... The James Joyce's Ulysses was famously stopped at the docks uh, from being uh, brought into America in 1921. Like, we believe ourselves as this free speech beacon, but there's an irony that all these guys who on the right talk about free speech are the ones not only like banning books in schools, but also using the Comstock Act <laughs> to uh, uh, go after abortion. Yeah, it's pretty, um, uh, it's pretty it's pretty nuts but um at the end of the day they're going to find any way they can 
to uh, go after abortion rights. And this is just part of the uh, onslaught. Um, let's go to this uh, polling. Are we dancing around here? We get a lot. Of, oh, I want to talk about this uh, subsidies that are ending uh, briefly um, for uh We talked about this uh, briefly yesterday, or at least we uh, headlined it. But there are two things to keep an eye out for stuff that's uh, ending um, because of uh, this budget, because uh, Republicans are just not going to allow it, and because uh, Joe Manchin inhibited the, um, uh, the Build Back Better bill and, you know, version one, two, and three even. Uh, we won't have Mansion in cinema next go round, um, but we also may not have a democratically controlled Senate or a democratic uh, president or a democratic oh house. Right. We'll see. Uh, but the affordable connectivity program, $14 billion um, from the federal government subsidized more than 23 million households receiving either reduced bills or essentially free internet service through the program. This is going to um, run out at the end of May. And then uh, in May, internet companies have the options to provide them with partial discounts using the remaining federal funding. Nationalize the whole thing. Uh, nationalize the whole thing, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Um, we are also uh, losing subsidies. Oh, now I've lost this now. Uh, well, um, that's what I've got. I'm sorry. I'm a little bit disorganized no, today, it's okay. folks. Um, all right. Let's go to um, the uh, one other thing that came out in terms of like the election um, in the fall. House Republicans uh, made a mistake of actually um, of letting people know what their plans are. Um, and it's interesting, there was a story today in, I think it was Axios, um, saying that the House uh, Republican leadership and uh, just the Republican uh, leadership more broadly are concerned that their House members are only trying to run against Joe Biden and they are finding that it's not working, that people are actually expecting the Republicans to have a plan. And again, I know I've been a broken record on this, but the idea that the Biden administration is not running against the do-nothing Congress, which you could easily tie into Donald Trump, because more often than not, they're not doing anything because uh, Donald Trump has told them, is a huge missed opportunity. Uh, but with that said, if they get a chance to do something, I don't think you're going to like it. No. The proposed 2025 uh, budget coming out of the Republican Study Committee which is made up of more than 170 House Republicans, vast majority of the Republican caucus. And I got news for you, the other um, 50 are probably to the right of this. They, um, despite the fact that they all screamed when he said, you're trying to cut Social Security, they will start with increasing the retirement age to qualify for Social Security and lowering the benefits uh, for the highest earning beneficiaries. So that's two things here. One is it's a cut to Social Security. If you increase, and, and, and for those of you who don't know, you can retire right now at age 62 and draw Social Security, but it's going to be a lesser amount than you will if you get it at 65. And in fact, 66 in a couple of months, I think right now, is the age and when you retire for full benefits and it's going up to 67 for people my age they want to raise this even higher which basically means that it's a cut there's no other way to describe it it is a cut to social security on top of which if they lower benefits for the highest earning beneficiaries how do you think they do that they develop some type of means testing. And this is also an incredible waste and will make Social Security uh, more difficult to access for everybody because we've got to means test everybody and make sure that you all aren't high uh, earning income individuals. We have a way 
to means test Social Security right now. And it is called taxation. If we are worried about wealthy people getting too much Social Security, we have a very easy mechanism in which to claw some of that money back. And it is called taxation. We already have a mechanism to do this. It's called the IRS. We don't need to create a new bureaucracy right. to means test. We can means test every single thing in this country by using taxes. We should be doing this with everything. You should be able to get Medicare or Medicaid. You should be able to get a whole host of benefits. And at the end of the year, if we've deemed that you are making more money than you need to get these benefits in part or in full, we simply tax that money back. And it's a very easy way of doing this. And it's very, very, uh, the reason why Republicans don't want to do it that way is because they want to create hurdles for people to access this stuff. They want people to be, um, uh, to be frustrated with government because they're making me dance through all these hoops. That's what they're talking about here. Then, if that's not enough, they want to mess with Social Security, the single most successful government program probably we've had in this country, maybe ever. Keeps two-thirds of our elderly out of poverty. And when your parents are not having to eat cat food in their retirement, you can save money to send your kid to college or to buy a home or whatever it is. They have a plan for Medicare, too, and it's called uh, basically privatization. Yep. They call it a premium support model. This is what Paul Ryan uh, wanted to do, which is um, we just subsidize your private. Um, it's basically Obamacare, but for everybody. And not even the good parts of Obamacare. It is uh, the privatized uh, part of Obamacare as opposed to the expansion of Medicaid. And I'm sure, I am sure, uh, if they're in a position to do this, they're also going to say insurance companies can rip you off like they used to. Of course. Um, and then we should also say they also, uh, in their uh, budget, which even though it has nothing to do with money, uh, that life uh, begins a conception act, which would grant rights to embryos and... Um, if you grant rights to embryos, I have a feeling these embryos are going to rise up and uh, say, hey, wait a second, this whole um, IVF thing, yeah. <laughs> part of us get thrown out. We're not going to want to do that. We don't want to do that. And it's really cold in the freezer where we're kept. So. Exactly. And they will just scream and scream, those uh, embryos uh, and the bastuli, or what is it called? Bastulots? I have no idea. Blastocytes. Um also, we should just add that uh, the Republican Study Committee in their 2025 uh, budget, which involves fiscal sanity to save America, um, instead of raising taxes on really wealthy people, it calls for a rollback of um, free lunch. In fact, a ban on free lunches. They want to eliminate the community eligibility provision from the school lunch program, uh, which allows certain schools to provide free lunches regardless of the individual eligibility of each student. Democrats should run on this. Democrats should put, like the way Tim Walls did in Minnesota, this should be just like every governor in the country begin to certify free lunches for, school, for, for kids in school. But you see the dilemma that the Republicans have. Well, this is a wish list to head off, like, essentially w the criticism of Mike Johnson for uh, getting Democratic votes on his budget, I'd imagine. That's the strategy, right? Well, I, this has been in works even before that, I think. I mean, the problem they have is that when they come out with their uh, proposals, they realize no one likes these. Yeah. And so they have literally nothing to run on. Um, the Democrats, at least... <laughs> By not fulfilling a whole host of their uh, uh, promises that people want, at least have stuff to claim that they're running for. But Republicans, even in theory, it, they're the only thing they can run on 
is uh, their racism, racism and xenophobia, but that has a lid on it, uh, frankly. And so they, they are stuck in this problem of not being able to um, offer really anything, anything beyond we're going to protect you from the non-existent caravan that is uh, marching in our way. Um, let's talk about uh, the most encouraging polling that um, Biden has seen in a while. Um, again, let me just read a couple of quotes from this Axios thing. There was a um, GOP's top fundraising committee for state level leaders uh, says that Biden doesn't hurt candidates down ballot in the way that some presidents have in the past, which is, I think, something that we've all been aware of. Like there is a unique problem with Joe Biden yeah. as a candidate. And but broadly speaking, people like the Democratic policies and Democrats more than the Republicans, at least in, the, in this context. The memo advised to steer clear of making the election a singular referendum on Joe Biden. Now, the problem is, is that's exactly what Joe Biden also wants. Don't make this a referendum on me. Yeah. Make it a question of choosing between me and Donald Trump. So they're, they have, a, they have a, a, a challenge here. The memo advised using Biden as your crutch. It said campaigns need, we need to make an affirmative case for GO policies, GOP policies. The problem is that nobody likes the GOP policies. They much rather prefer um, Let's Go Brandon as a uh, campaign slogan. Uh, we must learn from the missteps of 2022 cycle and sole and not solely target Joe Biden in our campaign messaging. They well, got nothing else. But they have nothing else to message with. That's that's the problem. The problem for the Republicans is what is because is Trump and the fact that they are Republicans. The problem with the Dem for the Democrats is that in fact actually things for them domestically are set up quite well in terms of negative partisanship. But Biden is so demobilizing and is seemingly making all the wrong choices over the past year or so that it's a question of does he sufficiently uh, depress turnout so that the, that advantage doesn't necessarily matter. But it seems like his State of the Union actually did have an effect. I, I thought the speech was good politically. Like it was like, OK, he's beginning to go on the offensive. And the polling seems to reflect that, even though I, 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 I there was some skepticism about whether it would change anything. I um, uh, were you here that day? After I, it was the day the day after I left for vacation. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, um, well, I think we were talking to I can't remember who it was. Was it Ryan Grimm or was it uh, a Digby? I, I found this State of the Union speech. I mean, aside from the fact that, you know, um, uh, I'm angry about the 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 the. the uh, Israel Gaza stuff and I don't think he you know I would have liked him to have addressed that more and up front I thought the speech was a huge uh, win for him yeah the, uh, the the quick polling afterwards did not show any bump but go and Google how many times people have said he's old and can't do the job since then I, I, I like that it, it killed that entire narrative he also um, was uh, emphasizing Social Security and Medicare in the speech and taxing the rich. And then we saw a week later that polling that we highlighted about how when you emphasize Social Security and Medicare versus Trump, it gives. Oh, yeah. Biden he has like a, a 55 to. Uh, it, know, like, uh, it was 51 or something, but still sizable compared to the neck and neck stuff. Um, these are, of course, uh, the most important polls because they um, are polling six key swing states. Uh, there was significant shift, and this is from the uh, Bloomberg uh, poll, Bloomberg and it, it's registered voters, so they haven't really yet built a, um, a good model, I think, this far out of who the likely voters are. That's the big question, like who are the likely voters? But in terms of registered voters... This is even more surprising in some respects, because I think um, likely voters might be uh, a, a better indication. But uh, almost 5,000 registered voters has a, a margin of error of only one percentage point. Biden leads Trump uh, by one point after trailing him by four points in February in Wisconsin. In Pennsylvania, 
the uh, candidates are tied after Trump held a six-point lead last month. And they are also tied in Michigan. Um, it's also a question, too, of Trump having to be more visible and people go, oh, right. Trump's more visible. The poll is also finding that uh, people feel better about the national economy with a gradual increase in the number of swing state voters who say it's on the right track. Um, Biden also made some ground up in Nevada, Arizona, and North Carolina, and uh, is still, uh, and Trump has actually added to his lead in Georgia, which is interesting. Um, and that could have been a function of like the Fannie Willis thing. That too. Um, but in uh, Nevada, it's a two point race. In North Carolina, it's a six point race, although that's closing. Um, in Georgia, it's a seven point uh, race uh, with Biden going down a little bit, actually. Uh, Trump seeming to just hold steady. And um, in Arizona, it is a, a plus five. Now, Arizona, there's going to be a an abortion rights ballot uh, referendum that's going to be on the ballot. Huge. And that supposedly uh, will uh, help. Well, especially because Arizona has one of the most draconian uh, abortion bans on the books. It's just it was passed in the 1800s and the Supreme Court in the state is currently weighing whether or not it's constitutional or not. So like in terms of that being a driver to the polls, I think the Republicans should be very worried about Arizona and all of the trends that we've seen over the past few years. I know the polling is kind of neck and neck right now, but we saw Carrie Lake lose. We saw, uh, yeah, uh, Mark, um, Mark Kelly win as well. So, um, and the governorship, Katie Hobbs. So I, I, I think that the Democrats are in okay shape in Arizona. That might be part of Biden's border calculation, which I still think is a massive mistake. But um, any state where abortion is on the ballot, I feel better about the Democrats' chances. And I mentioned the other day that Biden is sort of teeing up perhaps some executive action to... Uh, uh, I don't know what the, the, the best articulation, make a, make this country more hostile to immigrants and those um, uh, seeking uh, asylum. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's horrible. And, and, and really, I mean, in many respects, I think like the biggest drag, obviously, on the Biden administration is, um, I think, the um, Israel-Gaza policy. And it, I think, in the same way that, you know, there was a sort of a second order uh, bounce that came from the State of the Union address. Um, I think part of that was also it was the first time that he basically chastised Israel in public. Um, he didn't go nearly far enough as far as I was concerned. But I think that uh, for um, for some people, I think that that helped on some level. The biggest, I think, was just that it. Um, you know, uh, put to bed for the time being that he the the narrative that he's too old to be president. He's still obviously old, but it was the first time he also was like did it with a sense of humor about yeah. uh, being old. But the thing that I think uh, people are missing, and and I and I say this um, in part just from my own uh, sort of experience, but really more from talking to a couple of people who are in the sort of like. Uh, democratic activist community you know people who are you know um not necessarily aligned with the democratic party but um often work to push uh democrats and push them uh, to the left and also you know uh, uh, attempt to uh drive uh, voters out etc cetera, etc cetera. and a lot of these people are very demoralized um just simply based upon what what biden's doing it just makes their job for them just to personally do harder, never mind uh, that they're running into friction because a lot of these groups are obviously are out there trying to get young people involved in voting and, and organizing young people. And young people did not grow up with a um, deified version of Israel. Young people did not grow up with the sense that uh, Palestinians are subhuman. Uh, they did not grow up with the idea that like, well, 
you know, some people have to leave, uh, you know, land because other people want it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that happens. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, uh, younger people see the Palestinian cause as a racial justice cause. That's ex explicitly what it is. And it's the obviously it's the anti uh, Semitism on TikTok that's indoctrinating everybody. Just kidding. It's people seeing the daily humiliations of the Palestinian people and then now the genocide, which I think the images are so harrowing that when you see it on social media, that's the, what to explain the extreme divide. I think the social too. media is a big part of it because yeah. if you were to follow the American news only and did not have access to Instagram or or TikTok, or even Twitter, um, you would hear virtually nothing that was particularly critical of Israel. And I would imagine that even the stuff that you do hear that is critical of Israel would be less so because they wouldn't be consuming uh, the social media. You know, uh, and I think this has had a, and I think, you know, how people get their news is also, um, uh, you know, relevant in this kind because it's just much harder. There's a much more direct communication between what's going on in the ground. I mean, I've talked to people who are just like, there's no, um, you know, like we even saw that clip of, uh, of Dan Goldman, who uh, right. was um, uh, questioned by a protester. How can you support this? And he goes, I don't trust the numbers. I don't, et cetera, et cetera. This is after Joe Biden had said 30,000 in the State of the Union address. There's a Washington Post uh, piece out today. Yep. That is basically saying that all the experts we've spoken to say that this is probably a significant undercount. Of course. Of course it is. We haven't gotten an update on the 31 to 32,000 dead numbers in close to a month by this point. And famine, it has spread at this point i mean mass starvation and famine is in gaza right now so uh let alone the 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 32,000 numbers that haven't been updated don't even reflect the people missing under the rubble so it's a significant under undercount by thousands i think that's safe to say at this point